Thank you so much, Misty. Thanks everyone and welcome. We are really excited that you could join us this afternoon for this session of the Family Virtual Learning Series that focuses on working with English learners. I am Dr. Joan Lachance and I work at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Um, I want to go back first though and just give a quick shout out um, to our sponsor, um, the Alumni Association of UNC Charlotte. It's really important that we thank them um, for giving us this opportunity. But I am part of a, a magnificent panel today. Um, I'm honored to be the moderator, but I would love to introduce my panelists, my colleagues, and my friends. Um, joining me is Ms. Emily Francis. She is a wonderful alumni of our program at UNC Charlotte and a teacher with Cabarrus County Schools. We also have Dr. Laura Handler and Katie Wagner who are also alumni. I myself am also an alumni and um, Dr. Handler and Dr. Wagner are teaching with us in the College of Education as adjunct faculty. So we are really, really honored um, to be a part of your afternoon and share some information with you that we hope you'll find is beneficial and then give you an opportunity to ask us um, any questions you'd like to ask. So the first thing we wanted to do is get a sense of um, who you are and how we can really kind of guide the way that we work with you this afternoon, looking at the purpose of our series in, in being able to provide parents of pre-K-12 students with tips um, in our ever-challenging and changing times of, of periods of remote learning um, and best ways that we can support them. We know everybody in the community and us too in our community in UNCC has lots of questions around this topic and so we're hopeful that we can provide you with some, some guidance. We have three goals, um, and then we're gonna try to find out who, who you are and how we can kind of steer these goals to you. The first thing that we want to do is look for ways in general to support English learners with literacy development, both from an elementary and secondary perspective um, during periods of remote learning. And many of these things work in traditional classroom settings as well. So that's an important factor. We also want to discuss some community resources with you and then finally help you make some discoveries about the importance of students active engagement for language development because that is a critical aspect of the process. We're going to try to do this with a quick overview and then have our panelists share look at the resources that we've come up with collectively and then have a wrap up session that is reflective and open for questions and answers. So aligned with the goals of today's session, we just really want to um, share some ideas with you and provide as much guidance about um, resources and student interaction as we can. Welcome. Okay, Dr. Wagner, it's time for your poll. I think Dr. Wagner is gonna put the link into the chat box. It is there. Great. So if we could have you click on the link to the poll. It's a really quick process. You're just going to describe your role. And at the bottom of the polling question, it'll ask you to finish. And then Dr. Wagner can share some data <laughs> with us about who's in our audience. Yes, in addition to the poll, if you um, have any issues with maneuvering through that, please feel to let us know in the chat box. And if your role is not listed um, and you would like to share, you can drop that in the chat. Um, 
we have four um, responses. How many, how many do we have joining us? I think, I'll, I think we have four um, participants, yeah? I think yep. so. Okay, so um, we have a, an EL teacher, a classroom teacher, a community member, and um, Joyce, are you the, the roles not listed above the faculty site coordinator? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, that would be me. <laughs> okay, well, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we're kind of, we have everybody, I love it. Yes, we have a great mix, this mm -hmm. is wonderful. Okay, so Dr. Handler, with that in mind, just going to let you go ahead and great thanks Open Jen um, so first we're going to think uh, about this our, our trajectory of learners because we have quite you know um, English learners capture so many different backgrounds and diverse experiences um, so these might seem a little bit general but hopefully you can tweak them and apply but we want to think about first of all just that home learning environment and this is again more geared for the parents that are able to do this but we would encourage you teachers to showcase some of these with your um, your young learners at home and we also know that you know some options um, some homes have more space and more um, accessibility to different things too but I would just encourage you to um, by now hopefully we've got this this space expectations and then I really think with um, our young learners that the choices are important to let the child not only be involved in creating um, this space for learning, but really to also think about um, what choices do they have where they can choose perhaps some activities. Um, we'll talk about, Jen, if you'll hit the next, the next bullet, just a few things to um, those visual cues for students to be able to follow along. You know, normally we're in a bit of a rhythm now too, I think, but um, it's really important for them to know what to expect for the day. So, um, some uh, a must do or may do board um, is really important and even for our English learners to know when they're going to get a break um, when they have some choice in you know something is very um, taxing for them because it requires a lot of cognitive um, deliberation when you're juggling two languages and so I think having some of those options where they can um, have a little bit of choice and ownership in what they're doing is always great so um, um, those activities for the young ones to not forget, especially um, with the teachers that we have in our group. Um, I think anytime you can sense that frustration level, you know, if you have a little squeaky toy or, you know, some sort of signal where it's time for a dance party, it's time to get the wiggles out. Um, I think, you know, just as we would in the classroom, you teachers have, have definitely adapted to that and seen the need. Um, I would also just encourage you to think about, um, I think, again, the asset of teachers inside the classroom and then um, in remote learning is just our creativity and um, engaging students by celebrating the small things. So, you know, your positive reinforcement can come from wearing a silly hat or letting the kids one day have pajama day. We used to have that in school, so let them have a pajama day. Different things that you can, um, you know, positively reinforce. Um, even things that I know with my young one at home that has worked is as he's doing a good job, I, I put a little smiley face, um, if you want to hit the next bullet point, yeah. and we count how many smiley faces he has gotten during a time period, and then it's an extra minute of music. It's an extra minute of snuggles. It's, you know, so trying to think about these other things we can bring in. Um, in the classroom, you would be recognizing those things a lot too so um, you know just consider the ways that you can positively reinforce what they what you want to see um, and I would just say along with um, all of these different procedures or um, things that we're trying to establish is make sure you have a procedure for how to ask for help um, so that they don't tune out or they get to the point where, you know, they, they know either at home um, the ways to ask for help or if they need help outside of you know, the typical classroom, um, you know, that, that they have that avenue so that they know you're available. Um, you can go to the next slide. Great. So as we think particularly about literacy and that overlap with literacy learning um, in the first and the second language, um, again, this was a little bit more designed for parents at home, but um, I think just just like the, the fun of the classroom is that things are changing and things are new. Um, and, you know, home, we have these blended spaces now too. So I think it's important to try to bring in that engagement and fun and investment into, um, into the learning. So 
every now and then try to change up the reading space. Um, some different ideas are to, you know, go have a picnic outside, get a bunch of stuffed animals to read together um, that they can read to, grab some flashlights and make a cave in the closet. Um, you know, just any little things that you can do to, um, to liven it up. Um, I would also advocate changing the reading source. So, you know, we've gotten tired of reading the same books at home or what's available. So um, just I would advocate our public library, I know for us has been a huge asset um, during this pandemic um, that you can put things on hold and really encourage um, the students to help select, um, select what they want to read so that they still have some of that choice um, and to have that physical book um, rather than always having to rely on the electronic sources. Some of those um, digital libraries are fantastic, but um, that's just an idea. Tell or write your own stories. Um, encourage kids to, um, to think about something that's happened. If you've gotten a picture that you can print out or they can draw to illustrate, but um, then record and share them. All of these different um, modal ways we, get, we can integrate the different modalities of language with reading and writing and speaking and listening. Finally, I've got some links here to just um, some different songs that are fun um, and, and watching some of them. It, it's actually a link to how Khan Academy Kids has mm -hmm. used those super simple songs. And, um, you know, the great thing is that they have, um, you know, a lot of times the words and the lyrics right underneath in print. So again, you're getting to listen and, and hear it along with reading. So we're getting those different modalities. Um, I put a link to uh, uniteforliteracy.com, which has some digital books in English and Spanish, so that um, if you're, if, if the child is, is learning those two languages, that's an asset um, just to be able to have some books available in the first language. Um, environmental print we use so much in the classroom that that's an asset to use at home. Um, for anyone not familiar with the term, it's just bringing in those different um, things that we read um, all day long, you know, from signs to um, the, the brands or the names on our boxes of, of food and things like that. So it's trying to bring in, especially for those really emergent learners, is trying to show them some, some ways that they know um, the sounds and, and recognize the, those associations with letter sounds. Um, and finally, if your child is going to be watching some Netflix, some TV, as happens these days, um, turn on the captions. Um, and, you know, that's another way for them to see the print, of course, doesn't always align perfectly with what they're hearing um, if it's simplified a tad sometimes, but um, that's just another way. And just for anybody out there, you know, you can change uh, the captions with different languages. Um, so, you know, I would just encourage that to just be one other way to access a variety of languages and um, modalities. Um, sorry, there's that, that bilingual, um, English Spanish book site, uh, Unite for Literacy. And then the last thing that I would encourage you to think about is just changing up the audience so that there's a there's another purpose. You know, in school, we normally get to read to a reading buddy, um, whether it's in the classroom or sometimes somebody in, a, in another grade. And so I think if you can change up the audience so that they have another purpose for wanting to read to a grandparent, um, to a neighbor um, or, or someone else that you can think of just um, anything to break the monotony, I think, helps and, um, again, just gives a purpose for that language development. Just as a reminder, um, because this is uh, something that we show a lot of our, um, our students in a variety of programs, but um, just as a reminder of these different types of supports that you can incorporate either at home or um, as, a, as a teacher in the classroom, to just think about the different types of supports that help our English learners. So I'll let you peruse this list, but just to think about um, right now, sometimes we're limited in that interactive support that we can provide for them, unless you're you know, adept at using the, the breakout rooms and with young ones, that can be a challenge sometimes. But um, you know, thinking about those other types of supports that you might want to bring into your instruction all the time, you know, just a visual cue to hold up um, anytime that you're referencing a keyword or vocabulary term, um, or if it's directions, you know, just making sure that we can try to bring in some of those different visuals uh, that you would use in the classroom and have readily available that you can try to incorporate in different ways to help your English learners follow along.
Thanks so much, Dr. Handler. I'll just pause here for a moment and see if there are any questions that people have so far before we move on to our next panelist. Okay. Emily Francis, welcome. Oh my goodness, thank you so much for having me. What an honor. Oh my goodness, former professor, my ESL uh, administrator. And what's your job? I'm sorry. <laughs> You're way up there. Thank no, you that, so you know, that works. Oh my goodness. So I'm, I'm super honored uh, to be part of this panelist. And of course, going back to serving UNC Charlotte's community, it's that's where my heart is. That's the place that gave me the key to the profession I adore. We're so um, lucky to have you, Emily. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So again, I'm Emily Francis. I'm an ESL teacher at the high school level. I have been an ESL teacher at the elementary school level, but I have found my calling and passion at the high school. But I want to share a little bit of history as of why I ended up at the high school level. I was born in Guatemala. I lived in Guatemala for 15 years. That's a whole lot of time for me to learn my language, my culture, a lot of family background. You know, I lived with my mother. I was the oldest of five children. So I learned how to take care of my sisters and my brother. I took care, I was a full guardian of my brother and my sisters for two years back in Guatemala. So by the time I came here to the United States at the age of 15 years old, I have, I have lived so much. I brought with me to this country so much richness and culture and experiences and journeys that I was so willing to share with the world here in the United States. This is a picture of Martin Van Buren High School, the high school I was enrolled at the age of 15 years old. In Guatemala, I had only completed the sixth grade. So by the time I entered school here, I had lost a lot of, so I had a lot of interrupted education. I attended school for three years. I took my picture with my cap and gown. I learned the language. Unfortunately, I was not able to graduate because I did not pass the region's exam for the American history. Go figure. But, you know, because I had reached the age and I had accumulated all of my credits, I wasn't able to continue going to school. I was just told to return the year later and retake the test. And um, disappointed and with dreams shattered, I walked out of that school and over to a local supermarket and asked for a job as a cashier. So scanning groceries was my job for several years. And it wasn't really the purpose that I, that my mother had envisioned when she brought me here to the United States. It was not what I was meant to, to do and be. And you know, I always wanted to be a teacher. Golly, I knew I can be one of the best of the best. I have to say that, I'm sorry. I have to say that for myself. <laughs> oh, but I knew, I knew I was passionate to be a teacher. And so every time I scanned a grocery, it was a reminder that I was not in a place where I wanted to be. I was not in a place where I wanted to make a difference. And then so if you flip over the screen, um, years later, I moved over here to the Carolinas. So I put myself through RCC to get my GED, my associates, and was able to transfer to UNC Charlotte. And to make a long story short, I was about to drop out of UNC Charlotte because I couldn't pass the praxis to be an elementary school teacher. And then one of the guidance counselors just sat me down and said, why is it that you can't pass this test? And then the conversation started that I was a language learner that I was lacking in vocabulary and in language, but I had the experience and I had the richness and I had the, um, the power to be able to inspire others. So in that conversation, I was able to walk my way through being a teacher of English language learners. 
So it was 2012 when I first got my license to be a teacher. It took me like eight years to get my license, but I promise you the first time I walked in an empty classroom and they said, Ms. Francis, this is your classroom. I looked around those four walls and I promised myself that I was going to be the best of the best, that I was going to dig deep inside my students and make sure that I'm highlighting who they are, that they are not abandoning their languages, that they are being the best that they can be. I start working with students like here, this little student in the little orange jacket, he was very shy and he didn't want to speak to me nor English or Spanish. He just was shut down. And I was able to sit down with him and we started talking about the activities that he does at home. And he was telling me about how he plays with little brother and how sometimes he has to take care of him. And we started writing about those experiences that he was having at home. See, my own experiences in my household were not honored back then. My experiences were looked down as they're not important because they were never highlighted. But when I told this little boy that the experiences that he's living at home, it doesn't matter if you're not reading a book, it doesn't matter if you're not writing down your spelling words with your mommy, but what are you doing that highlights your culture? Are you making tamales? Are you making tortillas? Are you, are you making piñatas? What are you doing? So when students start seeing the value of who they are, they begin to shine. They begin to explode with all the potential that they had within them. His drawing on that writing that he was doing was so good that one author asked me for that drawing and it's now published in a book. My high school students also are inspired by my background and my stories and now they write their immigrant journeys. You see, when I first came to the United States and I walked into a high school, I did not have a teacher who would say, Tell me about your story. Where did you come from? What languages do you speak? What did you do in Guatemala? I would have loved for a teacher to ask me those questions because I would have shared me sitting at a market selling oranges and knocking on doors and selling all my goods because that was what I used to do and I loved it. But I never had that chance. So today I build a culture at my school where my teachers first priority before standards, before test, they take the time to get to know students. And the other thing is empowering families. I work really hard to make sure that my families are empowered to advocate for themselves. My mother, it's not like she didn't care about what had happened to me in school. It's just that she was really busy about working and putting bread on the table that she didn't think about how to advocate for me. So today I provide ideas for our students. I have a Facebook Live where I can share ideas and tips for, for parents because they need to be empowered to know that whatever it is that they're doing at home is validated. It's important. They are our teams in education. We're not above them. So when parents see that they're teaming up with us, it's just so empowering for them. So whether students are online or on campus, advocacy, self-advocacy is something I fight with my students. I don't write emails to teachers advocating for my students. I tell my students to write themselves to teachers so they can advocate to them for themselves. I don't write an email to school in behalf of parents. I show parents how to write the email and call the school so they have, they, not that they have a voice, they have a voice. They have to use it. See, they have a voice. We're not their voice. We're just a platform for them to be able to use their voice. So this is what I have to share with you. If anything you can take out of this, it's about self-advocacy. Whether a student is at an elementary level, middle school or high school, they need to feel that they can advocate for themselves and their needs. And from parents' perspective, they need to be empowered so they can advocate for themselves as well and feel that what they're doing at home with their children is validated. 
You see my mother, look at all the books I have today. And I read to my child every night. My mother did not do that to me, but I knew how to cook. I knew how to iron. I knew how to do business at the age of nine. My daughter doesn't know how to do that. <laughs> so whatever our families are doing at home, even if it's not reading a book, it's so important for them to understand that it is validated. Thank you so much, Emily. Every time I hear your story, it, it inspires me more and more. And just something really quickly that I wanted to touch on about this and, and not only validating, but honoring the, the students and their home lives. There have been a few times during this pandemic that I have thought to myself, perhaps this is an invitation in disguise for us to really open our eyes much wider and allow ourselves to share our homes with each other and allow our teachers to be a part of our, our children's homes and honor that situation. Not tolerate it, but honor it because there's an extreme difference there. And so I hope that um, your words will also resonate with people because it's so easy to hide the home life when we go to school. It's so easy to do that. And now perhaps this is an invitation for us to not hide anymore. Yes. I got a question from a friend the other day saying, what do I do with my second grader? He, he doesn't want me to talk about his culture. He doesn't want me to share anything about him. I said, it's not that he doesn't want to, he's just not used to seeing it enough. He's not used to being honored enough. So if every teacher that he goes to highlights his culture, his background, his language, it's not going to feel weird. It's going to feel like, God, let's do it again. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank and it's so not much. doing it just to be nice, right? Like it's yeah. from your heart. Like exactly. everybody's home matters. Exactly. Thank you so much. Dr. Wagner. Okay, well, um, since we do have, um, you know, people from each part um, of, I guess, of the community here, I did want to share some resources, um, both for our participants who may be in Mecklenburg County, and then I have to share some resources um, for that we have in Cabarrus County. And these are um, resources that are geared towards immigrant families, refugee families, um, our English learners. And um, I just think that at this time, um, it's really critical to, to be able to lean on our community um, and, and really dive into what, it, what is offered. Because we do, you know, here in Charlotte and in North Carolina, we, we have a lot of resources. Um, and I just wanted to kind of offer some to everyone. So um, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, um, their English Learner Services has compiled just a great list um, of resources, you know, places to find um, meals, food, nutrition, um, um, just other kinds of tutoring services, um, any, any sort of thing that, you know, any needs that were recognized during this, um, this pandemic, this time, um, CMS is um, compiled this list and offered it to their, their, um, their families. They're all also offering free tutoring for our um, K-12 English learners. There's a link there. Um, the English learner teachers in CMS are the ones that are running the program. There's also um, English classes for parents being run right now, also taught by the teachers, um, the English learner teachers in CMS. Um, and then I also wanted to bring you know, not everybody is a part of CMS, not all of the um, families are, um, have their children going to CMS. So there are other resources in Mecklenburg County, and these are just a handful. Um, Communo Community Center is kind of an all-encompassing holistic um, center that offers health services, um, you know, um, services for anyone who may be um, homeless or housing insecure. Um, they offer tutoring services, educational services, et cetera. Um, International House is just kind of an all-encompassing um, nonprofit that helps 
our various immigrant and refugee communities in Mecklenburg County. Um, the Southeast A Asian Coalition, SEAC right there in the middle, um, again is a coalition that um, started for Southeast Asian um, immigrant families, but um, they've expanded to, they really will help um, anybody who asks for it um, with pa uh, citizenship paperwork or any sort of documents that need to be filled out among other things. Um, Our Bridge for Kids is uh, an after school program. They serve um, just a handful of schools in um, Mecklenburg County, but they're, the other services they offer, they've been delivering meals all across Mecklenburg County um, during the pandemic, all throughout the summer. So their services are also um, very broad, even though maybe their programming is um, specific to a couple schools. Yep, and then um, in Cabarrus County, we also have a number of resources for, um, for our families. So um, every year we host um, a Hispanic Family Resource Night and um, there's a list of organizations that join us for that there. Um, again, it's, um, you know, lawyers, um, nutrition services, um, et cetera, just a number of um, bilingual partnerships that we have um, here in Cabarrus County that are serving our, our families. Um, and then our, um, the Cabarrus County ESL department here works very closely with um, El Puente uh, Hispano. So that um, program right now is also offering um, tutoring services and school help um, throughout the day, not just after school for, um, any, any students that need it in Cabarrus County. Um, the Latin American Coalition is actually in Mecklenburg County, but they um, reach across counties um, to help our, our families. Um, and then we have two churches that are, uh, that we partnership here with uh, St. James the Greater Catholic Church and then West Cabarrus Church. I'm always looking for that mute button. <laughs> so thanks so much, Dr. Wagner, for sharing those wonderful and really beneficial resources with us. So I just wanted to offer, um, as we come toward the second half of the presentation and get ready to have kind of some open question and answer time, a few quick tips about working with lear English learners. And the first one is really, really important. We want to remind you and we want you to help us remind parents that more English doesn't actually mean more English. <laughs> so there's this um, myth with second language development that has people thinking, well, if I want to learn English, I better just stop speaking Spanish and stop reading in Spanish or Vietnamese or whatever the home, the student's um, home and community language is. And that actually really works against the process. Based on physiological aspects of literacy transfer and how our brain works, it's really important that we work with English learners and emergent bilinguals, all of our long-term English learners and everybody in between, just to focus on exposure to literacy-like activities. So kind of like what Emily was saying, yes, it's important to read text, environment, or I'm sorry, I think it was Dr. Handler, environmental text, right? Like what words do kids have access to in any language? Read the cereal boxes, read comic books, read the instructions on how to put a piece of furniture together. And if you've ever bought something at Ikea, you know how complex this is. <laughs> Um, because the more literacy-like activities that our students work with, the more literacy they will, they will develop in, in English and, and a language other than English. The critical piece with that is not just to stop at the reading and the exposure to reading. It's to then go beyond in the home environment and look for ways that our students can do things with each other to apply their learning or perhaps do things with you if you're the if you're a parent of a student that's learning at home it just depends on the context and i'll try to 
explain why that's so important? The doing part is so critical for, for the learning processes. So when we talk about language development and in the context of, of content information, so we're learning English through science or we're learning mathematics through Spanish, whatever the language of instruction is, um, the brain requires that information to come in, of course, right? When we teach, we are firing information at our students, whether it's through a computer, in a traditional classroom, outside in the, at the picnic table. Wherever that is happening, we're providing that information, we're firing it. And then the students, when that information comes in, as they're learning, they have to wire the information. So it's, it goes far beyond just memorizing things. Kids need multiple pathways to apply the information that they're learning with as much creativity as possible. So if you're measuring, you're learning about parameter, perhaps, and all of a sudden your child jumps up and runs to the back part of the kitchen and starts measuring the parameter of the, the back part of the kitchen. And then they run to the pantry or they run to grandma's room and they're measuring the parameter of these rooms because they're part of their home. Or maybe they're measuring the parameter of a playground in, in their community, whatever that is. They have to actually do something with the information that they're learning. This can also work across grade levels and across content areas. So if you have siblings working in the same home in settings of remote learning, this is actually a really wonderful, I know it doesn't seem like that, it's a wonderful opportunity for those students to work together to apply common skills. So if there are things that they're learning in math that are similar to each other, have them do something as a home-based project or in science or, or social studies, whatever that is, that can work. It can also go beyond the house and work in the community. So for example, if you have a very ur center urban setting um, and there's no space for a community garden, we, I saw this happen with a, a small community where a group of different grade level students came together. They wrote a letter requesting the donation of a big, um, it's like a, a container that they use to feed cows. It's made out of galvanized tin. It's huge. And they wrote a letter in English, they wrote a, the same letter in Spanish, they, they edited each other's writing, they asked for the materials to be donated, they came together to plant the, the seeds that they picked a few items that they knew would grow in that area and so on and so forth. And then they worked together to maintain that space. It was not huge, right? And they could write about science. They could write about social studies. They could make that connection to crops that were um, native to North Carolina or this part of North Carolina. So my point with this is, it's really important to think outside the box and allow students to apply as much knowledge as they can while they interact with each other. Because that sense of, of student to student interaction is absolutely critical for language development. With student engagement, we had um, a request for some information about this. You have all as teachers known when students appear to be engaged and they aren't. So they may be demonstrating body language that indicates they're paying attention. But mentally, they have like, they've, they're sliding off and they're not thinking about what's happening in the context of the computer or even in a traditional classroom setting. And as teachers, I, I can say with, with sincerity, 
we often let that go because as long as the students are quiet and they're not disrupting, then we're just going to keep on teaching. <laughs> and not necessarily paying attention to who isn't learning because they're not, they're no longer engaged with their thinking or their feelings. So back to Emily's example of working with the little boy who could draw pictures, who could, she could have a conversation with about tortillas and you know what was happening. That evoked an emotion in that child, which then connected to the motivation to stay engaged. And so even in remote settings, we have to think about ways that we can evoke emotion in our kids so that they are hooked to complete the projects or the assignments that we want them to learn. Working quietly is not necessarily a benefit when it comes to language development. There are students who are easily distracted that I get that and I'm not saying that that doesn't exist, but on the flip side of that, when the teacher structures a collaborative activity, even in a remote setting, where the kids have to interact with each other and they depend on each other for a collective result, then they begin to talk. And it's, a, it's a, something that they're interested in. The emotion is connected. They're not seeing it as, oh my gosh, this is the most boring thing. I can't believe we have to do it, but let's just, let's let Emily do it because she's the smart one and I'm going to sit over here and be quiet and pretend to pay attention. <laughs> we want all the kids to have those emotions and levels of interest evoked. And the easiest way to do that is to pay attention, right? Like know who your kids are find out, like Emily said, create those relationships, find out what they're interested in. And that will help you decide about the roles here and keeping kids engaged. So we also wanted to share this with you. Um, it's a resource about K-12 online learning. There's the, the QR code and also the, the direct link. Um, and then just in closing, we'd like to, to just provide you with a few reminders before we open up for questions that we want students to stay interested. We want them to be involved and actively engaged rather than actively disengaged to apply the skills that they're learning. And that our students need to do things and that they can do them at home that go, they, this has to go far beyond a traditional worksheet. They need to actually do something that involves them to be actively participating beyond completing a worksheet. We want students to be prepared for remote learning and we really want parents to be prepared for remote learning, understanding that it is very different than the traditional classroom. So we can't recreate traditional school, brick and mortar school at home. And we shouldn't even necessarily try to recreate the same experience. What we're asking is to shift, right? We're asking people to shift and be innovative because it's really hard to, to make a traditional classroom setting work in a computer. We want you to recognize the need for frequent breaks. As Dr. Handler reminded us, even with older people, we need to get up and do something. Go, go outside and find acorns. <laughs> Count them. You, you know what I mean? Like get, have your students take frequent breaks so that we get that oxygen going and they're not dying of Zoom fatigue, right? And that it's okay to rest. We all are under very different levels and very different kinds of stress. And so whatever we can do to nurture ourselves is really important. That's a big part of self-care, teachers included, parents included. We need to ask our kids, what are you doing that makes you feel safe? What are you doing that makes you feel nurtured? For me, 
It's being able to have my, my apple cinnamon tea with me. This makes me feel nurtured. This makes me feel good. And accepting and honoring those pieces within the learning processes. Those are just kind of our closing remarks. Is there anything um, that we can do to, to answer questions for you? Before we remind you of our upcoming upcoming panels. <laughs> because we are in a small group, is there anyone that has a, a specific circumstance that they want to, you know, request help or ideas? You know, we are a group that can brainstorm together. So if there's something, you know, more specific to what you are looking for um, or want to discuss, please feel free to throw it out there. The quiet group. Well, I'll make a comment, Joan. Um, Joyce Frazier here. Um, this, I just want to say that this has been wonderful. You all are amazing. I work with student teachers, and sometimes they have questions about their learners in their classrooms um, that are doing the, you know, I just, I can't imagine being an EL, <laughs> an ELL learn, a language learner. Um, that would be so intimidating to me. And I think about these little ones all the time. And so I just wanted to attend this today to, to get some ideas and some resources that when I have students come to me, I'll, give, I'll have something to share. So thank you to all of you. We're lucky to have you. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks. Joan, would, um, would you mind going back uh, two slides for me, please? Sure. Um, so um, Joyce, this was uh, a great opportunity to, to, to point out this resource um, too as well. So for everyone on the call today, the link to this resource here, this resource is a live document. It is, it is updated daily with resources um, compiled for, um, no, no, I mean, it, it's a great resource for parents and guardians, but it's also a wonderful resource for classroom teachers. And it includes information or links from all of our panels that we're doing. So there's links on here for general education. There's links for um, special education, links for English um, learners, as well as early childhood. So um, uh, you'll receive the, a copy of this presentation of the slide deck, so you'll have all the links and you can click on them. So just keep in mind that this is a living document, and so go back to it often and um, refer to it as it's updated um, quite often. So uh, Beth um, Orsam in our Ed Leadership Department from, from the Center for um, Teaching and Learning has put together this document. So, um, so thank you for um, asking the question and about resources and um, thank you to all of our panelists. This has been amazing today. You're quite welcome. Any other questions? No questions, just a comment to say hey to my friend Emily. Hola, Emily. Hola. Yes. It's, it's Tilly. Oh my goodness. <laughs> How did you find out about this wonderful um, opportunity? <laughs> my connection. Wonderful. So good to have you here today. Thank you for joining it, it's, us. <laughs> yeah, it's really good to hear your story. It's, um, I know Dr. Finley said, Miss Fredette, tell us your story. And I'm like, I don't have one. I was born and raised in California. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but she, yeah, she was really awesome. Actually, all the information that y'all have provided has been awesome. Um, I'm at a new school and I'm really excited and there, there's going to be many opportunities to bring families on board um, and provide them with the resources that you have and, and to build that connection and that relationship. And um, this was just another way um, and another opportunity for me to just, you know, add to my toolbox. So, gracias. Domo arigato. <laughs> Danke schön. A su orden, siempre. <laughs> I love it. 
Any other questions or feedback? Okay, well, we'd really love to remind you um, about the upcoming panels that we have. On October 28th, there's a panel about early childhood. On November 11th, there's a panel about mental health, and we could certainly all use more information about that. And, and then following that on November 18th, we have um, a panel regarding wellness and resilience. The registration information is there. We hope that you will be able to join us for additional sessions. And Misty, what, what am I forgetting in the end? Mm -hmm. uh, just go to the last slide uh, that uh, for, for contact information uh, for our panelists today. Again, thank you, um, Dr. Lachance, for um, moderating and facilitating the panel. Thanks for our wonderful panelists uh, for joining us today. Um, in addition to the contact information that's here, I just want to give a special shout out to uh, follow Emily on Twitter. <laughs> Um, Emily, tell, tell us about your, your uh, Twitter account. Oh my goodness, it's, it's, a, it's a way for me to connect with educators around the world. It's just a tool, you know, you create your handle and then you just tweet whatever you, not whatever comes to your mind, but resources that could be helpful in the classroom. And I've been able to connect with, I mean, teachers in Thailand, and oh, I can't even mention them all, but it's amazing to see how the community comes together just through a simple social media tool. Um, so yes, I, that's just my go-to resource to find links, to find support, to find, you know, uh, family, because if we become family, we get to know each other through this Twitter. Yep, it's a great resource, like you said. And it's a great way to make connections and find out how we can support each other. Awesome. I'm gonna tweet with some pictures later, Emily. <laughs> Me too, let's see who does it first. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's funny because I do, I use Twitter a lot and that's my professional platform. But yeah. then I had to add my professional Instagram because my students are on Instagram, my high school students. And then I had to add a professional Facebook because my parents are on Facebook. So now I try to keep up with all this social media. But I love sharing what I do through social media. And my students feel so much pride in, in, in seeing their pictures and you know showing their work. And they like seeing that. Sometimes they don't, but they do. They do like to see themselves out there in the world. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, well, I guess it's time for us to conclude. We're finished a little early. We thank you all so much for coming. Yes. And again, thank you and have a few minutes back of your day. Mm -hmm. so, thank you so much.